So, weed regulations. Quick question for you. Do you guys remember what the law is, the legislative piece that enforces at the federal level um, the movement of, of noxious plants, including weed seeds and so forth? PPA, the Plant Protection Act, okay? And again, if you just Google that and would like more information, I mean, it's, it's, it gets, you know, you get legalese, legalese, a lot of information and stuff, but that's really the key. So what I wanted to point out here is that you have certain states and Canadian provinces that have what's called a tier noxious weed list. And what that means is that they, they have, say, the worst category. Absolutely no weeds, typically it's weed seeds, are allowed of these species. And the reason that they do that is what, why do you think that they would put certain species in this really kind of the definitely do not, we cannot have these plants in there. What would be some reasons why that would differentiate one species from being in the, you know, do not allow this in to, yeah, we'll allow it, but uh, at this, you know, level, at 1% of your crop seed could have, you know, 1% of those seed could be uh, field bindweed, say. Why are, for some cases, absolutely not, nothing is allowed? You get even one or two seeds, you're in trouble. Okay, and this varies by states, that's why I didn't want to give you full lists, but I'll give you an idea. Anybody can tell me, what would be some of the characteristics that you think would a, get legislators to think and regulators to say, no, that is not even at 0.5% we want to see this thing. Josh? Well, I suppose different weeds are going to have different uh, modes of reproduction and, and going to be different sort of threat levels. And some weed might come in and just sort of stay very sessile in the area, but others might just, just go. So kind of a lot of the biological, you know, components of the plant, okay? Um, so things, if something's wind dispersed, that might be more of an issue, a plant like milkweed that's going... What other issues? What are some of the threats? Threats to what? Right. Okay, absolutely. And there's a federal noxious weed list. Um, I'm going to try. I just printed it out, but I'll, I'll try to email you a copy of it. I mean, a lot of species are nothing that we probably have seen. But just to show you, none of those are allowed in the country to come in from elsewhere, and some that are here, they're undergoing eradication, okay? So yeah, kind of this already being on the blacklist. So, but what other characteristics for other species that might actually still be here? It could be a weed that competes really well for the niche of whatever most of the farms are in the area. Okay, so clearly an agricultural, I'm trying to get at a couple of things here. What would make a weed a problem to society? I mean, clearly, if it's a threat to agriculture, wherever cropping system you're in, what other threat could it to society? Could weeds? We've talked about them. Health. They're you know they cause they're, they're poisonous. They're uh, they cause allergies, and that's how they come up with this tiered list. So you'll see things like ragweed come to the top in many areas. Uh, Canna thistle mostly because it's aggressive and a threat to agriculture, and seeds are dispersed. Although it's got deep, deep creeping roots. So that's why I'm, I'm saying that some of the states, and it's not surprising that very important agricultural states like California and Florida tend to have very well-defined tiered systems, okay? And so absolutely will not allow this species, and you could visit each of the department, you know, just go to the Department of Ag for each of the states and you could actually see their list. Just type in, you know, um, noxious weed list for California, you will see all these species listed, that they are not allowed to be even at 1% in, within, um, within, you know, seed that's sold, okay? Simple noxious weed list, many of the states have those. That's n not bad, it's actually a start. It's just, you know, one simple li list that basically says, we're, you know, these species um, should not be allowed. However, uh, if you get them in turf at, you know, 1% of the turf seed that you buy, uh, has, uh, you know, uh, poa annua seed in there, that's allowable, but, but no more than that. So um, they're screened, and if the company is found to violate this legislation, then they, they pay a fine and the material is sent back, okay? So they go in and they take subsamples, a bit like I told you with the mango, uh, the aphis folks down in Arizona where they subsample. They can't sample everything coming in. Um, but there have been situations where they've sent the material back and charged the company, Scott's, has, it's happened a few times that Scott's has been fined because of uh, weed contaminated uh, turf seed, okay? But that, that goes for the same for animal feed. A lot of stuff coming out of the Midwest in, includes seed that is difficult to separate from crops. 
especially when you're kind of into alfalfa and some of these other species. There are weed seeds that are very closely related that can make it right through um, the sieving process. Okay? Again, striking the New York, you know, so legally there's a couple of, of species that weed seeds are not allowed into, into New York State, and, but it's hardly enforced. And as Alvin said, what happens is when you have these, you know, states in white here, these become the dumping grounds for companies that want, you know, have contaminated seed and they just, just bring it there because n nobody's going to regulate it. So uh, that's a concern and why in New York State we really want to have this. New York State has a top 20 invasive species list, but there's no real teeth behind it. Nobody can force you. You go on the website and here's, you know, swallow what is in there, Japanese knotweed, the kind of garlic mustard. But nobody can force you legally to get rid of that or not allow it to, to be transported unless it's on the um, federal noxious weed list. And many of these are unfortunately are not because that list is really trying to prevent things from coming in than necessarily things that are already here. How do you get, you know, get rid of Japanese knotweed? Okay? So, again, the Plant Protection Act, but this gives you a sense that it's a, it's a mishmash between the different states and, and Canadian provinces. So it's, it's a, you know, sometimes it's a mess trying to figure out who's, and this goes for herbicides, by the way. There are herbicides that are registered in other parts of the country that are not registered in New York. The companies don't even want to register. New York and California are considered tough places to register herbicides. We'll talk about that, or pesticides in general. Okay? So companies don't bother. And what happens, that, that affects our, our growers because they don't have access to some products that, okay? And there are reasons why DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, does not allow those, um, some of those herbicides to be, to be brought in. And we, we could talk about that when we, we cover the course. But just recognize that this is not limited just to wheat seeds and nauseous lists, but also to herbicides. Yes, uh, Ben. Do, do you think Yeah. Over. Like, it just seems like it's a, either a huge waste of money or something is, the, something's flawed. Right. No, and I think even the regulatory agencies will, will, will agree with you that it's, it's a losing battle, uh, that, that you know, it's going to be pretty tough to stop these things from coming in. Uh, the, the question is, this uh, you know, uh, early detection, rapid response becomes really critical. I mean, you try to do the best to hold things back, but, and as... Some of you in IPM know, you know, eventually things make it in. Uh, they will make it in. The question is, how quickly can you jump on these things to at least keep them in check? And, uh, you know, some of our worst invasive plants, remember, I've been here more than 100 years, and we'll talk, you know, we'll talk a little about that. Uh, you know, swallowed, it didn't just come here yesterday. They've been here, but the thing is, they've, something's happened to them that's allowed them to just take off. Uh, and Japanese knotweed, uh, purple loose drive, garlic mustard, these did not arrive two days ago. They've been here, established, almost, I wouldn't say naturalized, and then something, and that's what the, the, you know, the question is, what happened? What has happened in, in the last 20 years? It's not just us that we're better at the identification. I'm sure that's part of it. But I, I think there's some underlining factor, whether it's climate change, land use history, which might be something for swallower that's happening, or genetically, the plant needed that amount of time to, to, be, you know, to build up its genetic diversity to allow it to occupy all these sites. That's where a lot of the ecology on invasive weed biology is going right now, trying to understand why certain habitats are susceptible, what makes a certain community susceptible, but also what are the traits and the reasons why certain invasives, you know, have become. Because as I told you, there are many species, you know, common chicory, some of these things have been around, even things like uh, uh, perennial south thistle, yeah, they're bad here and there, but certainly they haven't taken over the whole, you know, the whole place, and we can control them, and, but why a few haven't done it? So, to answer your question is, um, basically, yeah, it, a lot of things will come through. I don't know how, if it's, how good it is to put that money there. Perhaps maybe it's best to put it in early detection, rapid response, and that's where the government is kind of going, eradication, rather than, you know, because there's all these holes in there that, it's a good point, and that's what, what, you go on the APHIS website and there's the, you know, blogs and those are the discussions that are going on. So my sense, my personal sense would be, yeah, I would spend more time in terms of the detection control and thinking about what should we be, they could certainly let us know, hey, we've got these plants on the horizon or these, these insects or these pathogens, let's learn about them because they're likely to get here. 
Instead of, you know, they get here like Asian longhorn beetle, and then we're running around trying to figure out what is this thing and what do we do, okay? As much as possible. Some things we just don't know. They arrive and, you know, we're trying to figure out what they are. Yes? Uh, out of the weeds on the top of the West of New York, are most of them uh, invasives? Or is it split down the middle? Or are mostly the, uh, this, is an, uh, this is what I'll send you. The, uh, the, just to give you an idea, you don't have to jot them since I'll email them to you, but it's, it's the New York noxious weeds that are listed, and this is particularly for seeds. They're mostly agronomic. They include field bindweed, okay, convolvulus arvensis, quackgrass, Elytrigia repens, Canada thistle, Cerzia marvans, the bedstraw species, both catchweed and smooth bedstraw, gallium species, daughter, which is a, par a parasitic weed, okay, cuscuta species, horse nettle, Solanum carolinans that you saw this week, wild onion is in there, allium, okay, corn cockle, it's a species we haven't talked about, but you see it in cereals, it's got this little pink flower, it's really pretty, okay, um, Agrostema jethago is, is the scientific name, and Russian napweed, not the spotted napweed, but the Russian, Acroptilon repens, those are the main species, so that's why we do not have an invasive, like more of natural areas, that is just the Invasive Plant Council in New York State, there's this group that, and in fact now there's a new Invasive Species Institute on campus, right in, in, in Rice Hall, that's going to coordinate invasive, not just plants, but invasive species in New York State. They, they just received $5 million from New York State, um, not just Cornell, but, other, but it's, it's going to be housed here. And their goal is to try to get this list that we all know about that should you know, have some teeth behind it, hopefully pass through the legislature. But given what's going on you know, with the financial situation, I mean, that is right at the bottom of, their, you know, of Governor Patterson's agenda. I mean, clearly, you know, that's not going to be some... But, that's the goal, okay? So yeah, we don't have, so it's all basically agronomic weeds. And this is seeds that would come in in contaminated feed, or, or in this case, in some cases, maybe even turf seed, okay? On the, in that same article, uh, the Skinner article, they list, what they looked at, they looked at all the states in the Canadian provinces and they tallied each, for each invasive species, how many times does it appear in a noxious weed list for how many states in Canadian provinces? Okay, and the, the species that makes it to the top, okay, if you want to, who's the, the worst, you know, worst of the worst is Canada thistle. On 33 noxious weed lists, okay, and uh, what BCA stands for, I think it's the number of biological control agents approved for release in contiguous U.S. So it gives you an idea of where, you know, clearly it's an important, I mean, how many biocontrol agents have been released. The article was looking particularly at you know, what should we target? What are our worst agronomic and invasive species? After that is, is musk thistle, cardius, cardius nutans. We don't have that much of that here, but in the, in the Midwest it's there. Uh, lithrim, loosestrife. So a lot of these. Look at this. Is this Euphorbia esula with the 15? I'm trying to see. Can you guys see that? I think it's, it's leafy spurge. Field bindweed. Russian napweed. Sorghum. You know, some of these centuria species. Um, spotted napweed. Perennial south thistle. I mean, this is the who's who, but you get an idea that, you know, at least all these top guys are at least on 20 lists, okay? And remember, some of the states do not have lists at all. So I'd imagine that New York State, Canada, the so as we saw, it's, it's on there, um, okay? So this, this gives you an idea, okay? Nightshades, you name it, okay? Again, not here for you to memorize, and to, but just get a sense that there is this information out there, and some of the states are very vigilant. You go out to the, uh, to the uh, Great Plains and stuff, they're serious about their, their weeds and, and management because, you know, ag is such a big in the Midwest as well, okay? Uh, and their systems are not as diverse as they are in the Northeast, so they really depend on, you know, important legislation, okay? So within the Plant Protection Act, there is also what's called the Federal Seed Act, and that really is what regulates the movement of seeds from other countries into the U.S., but also between states, okay? So the federal government does have oversight, although each of the states has their own, you know, wheat seed laws, there is a federal seed, seed act. Uh, again, how much of that is really enforced is still a question. It's still out there. I mean, it's, it's sad to say that we've got these laws, but if nobody enforces them, and it's just because it's so hard and, the, you know, the people power just isn't there to do it, 
but just so you're aware. Uh, what I did is I pulled out some information for the Indiana seed law, okay? And they have this tiered system. That's, I just want to show you what, it mean, what, what a tiered system means, okay? And this is in relation to weed seeds, okay? Not actual plants. And that's the other thing. Often when I talk to you about, I don't know, did I mention to you this whole ragweed problem up in Canada? Where if they found ragweed on your, in your piece of land, did I mention that at all to this group? Well, the, you know, what that, that is really looking at plants that have emerged. Um, most of our laws really focus on the weed seeds as kind of the source. We don't want the source. Eventually, these will germinate. So uh, I just wanted to point out that that's really looking at seed laws. So they have a number of weed seeds, and I, would, I wasn't able to, to write them all in, but where they basically uh, will not accept, if you find, you know, and I think like field bindweed is in this group, a lot of the stuff that I just read for New York tend to be in this group. Basically, zero tolerance. You find one or two, in, you know, in any subsample that some of these uh, regulatory agencies, so in Indiana, would find that, boom, the shipment goes. And they have ways of subsampling packets, okay? Um, there's a group that of species that are also pr problematic, but they call those restricted, okay, noxious weed seeds. Again, just a little more flexible and lenient with this group. I mean, it's still pretty low, okay? And usually the 0.25% is based on the weight, okay? They, in some cases, it's based on the whole lot, the weight of the lot, and sometimes they'll take subsamples of um, seeds that's the more tedious, and actually count them out and say, you know, 0.25% of the total seeds. So I take, the way they do it is usually take 100 grams of seeds, and they look through them and try to see if they find it's random samples and try to see what percentage weight, okay? And, of course, that's a little misleading because you might have, you know, one, you know, noxious weed that's, you know, real heavy or really tiny, and it doesn't, you know, for the noxious list, you just see it, it's gone. But here, you might have, you know, a few little, many little seeds that may not add up to 0.25%. So in some cases, they actually want counts. It's 0.25% of the total number. And, and, and it's not the same for every state. That's why I can tell you. So when you're reading the legislation, look to see when they say 0.25% allowable, what do they mean? Do they mean number-wise, okay, counts, or do they mean by weight, okay? And so that, that, that it, and it's always, sometimes it's not clear, even some of the legislation. And then you've got those that, they're problematic weeds, but you can, you can afford getting them. And these tend to be ones that are so ubiquitous, they're so common, that they know you can't get rid of them. Okay, and they're already around, but at least try to cut down. You don't want, you know, half your seed lot to be weed seeds. Okay, but really what they focus on is this group here because these tend to be, have health issues. They may be really problematic in that state because of, you know, very, you know, vulnerable crops or susceptible crops, okay? So, but like I said, um, clean seed can play a major role in limiting spread of weeds. I, I used to cite a, a um, uh, um, I guess a, a number or, or a percentage or weight of seeds that were being transported on a daily basis in this country. I had some data, but it was like dated from 98. But it, what, it really hit home because it basically said in any given day there would be, and I don't know if this, because this is not, you know, 10 years ago, if, if it's any better, but they basically said th in, in the country on a daily basis there were about 20 tractor trailers. If you would fill 20 tractor trailers with wheat seeds, that's how many, how many wheat seeds are being transported on average on a daily basis across this country. I mean, that's, that's a lot of weed seeds, tractor trailers, you know, 54 foot, okay? That's just, and I didn't want to cite that because I, maybe that's it. I was trying to look for more, you know, important, but recognize that a lot of weed seeds are being transferred. It's not a little, you know, coin envelope that we use in research that's got the little weed seeds. I mean, you're talking, if you would sift out all those seeds that have been stored in bins and so forth in the Midwest and the Great Plains and so forth, you could see how it builds up. So the idea is to try to cut that down as much as possible, okay? So this is what I want to end with from the preventive control. The question is, what can you do on your farm, okay, in your operation that could maybe really help out in terms of prevention? And these are, you know, I've, I've collated these from a number of sources, and they constantly hit the same thing, and I just want to go through. Some of them apply directly to some of you, 
depending on the kind of uh, farming and, and operation you have. Others, maybe not as much, but at least you should be aware of, okay? And why are you guys spending six, seven weeks identifying weeds, in some cases weed seeds? Because the number one preventive measure in all of these references that I've looked at and, and I've gone to enough meaning is be able to identify weed, the weed. I mean, it's, you have no clue what the weed, and if you don't know, is get it identified, okay? Because you won't know all the species, especially if you're working in other parts of the country or some new species coming in, okay? But now you, a lot of you have at least a sense, hey, this looks more like an Asteraceae, some, or yeah, it looks with the world leaves like it's, you know, it's one of those uh, Bethstraw species, could it be, okay? Number one, okay? The other thing is you perform control measures on isolated patches of new weed. Um, we, we talk about that in invasive plant ecology a lot, that if you've got a large infestation and then you've got small populations, that are, you know, little fires that are going off in, in different parts, you are better off knocking off those isolated weed patches than trying to manage this large patch, if, particularly if you don't have the resources and funding to do it, okay? So that's what, where early detection, rapid response, you know, you sit there and you've seen a weed that, well, I haven't seen this in a while, and you sit there for three years doing nothing about it, you're going to be in trouble. Whereas if you, oh, you know, this compost pile, I've never seen this before, I brought in some mulch, what is this thing? You should jump on it. Okay, and then when I work with growers, that's one. I go to the manure piles, I take a look around, you know, where they're carrying stuff, and I always ask if they're boring equipment, especially out of county, in some cases out of state, say, take a look at your machinery, your combines, especially now that you have these custom, you know, folks that are going from state to state, they are bringing stuff. You, you open up one of those combines and you look inside, you should see how many seeds you would find. There's a, an article that was published. Just, who's going to open and clean it out all the time? No, it's too much, too much work. But they actually took one apart. And the number of weed seeds from, it was from the Great Plains to the Midwest was just horrendous. And if any of you are interested, I could give you, I give you that article. It's a kind of popular newspaper article, but it was really neat. It really kind of shows you what, what's being carried. So, okay, again, they may get in, but at least, you know, do your best, okay? Effective weed management in the crop. I mean, that's... So if something's brought in in manure and you're, you're spreading the manure on your fields, if you can at least manage and control, you know, those, those, those populations, then you're better off. If they're just sitting there growing in new species, then you're going to be in trouble, okay? Control late-growing weeds and survivors before they set seed. I would say this is probably one of the things that, that most growers don't do, most gardeners don't do. So at this time of year, most of us are starting to think about going indoors. We don't want to be outdoors. You should take a look at some of the vegetable gardens around, if you get a chance, some of these community gardens. Take a look at the plant, the weeds. Crabgrass is setting seed. The foxtails are setting. It's like the crop, well, July, they're all gung-ho, May, June, July, and then, okay? For growers, so many other things to do. They've got to harvest. They've got to, you know, and they're not going to, if the, the combine misses a plant because it's this tall and it's got weed seeds, that just happens. And, and you understand why they can't do it. But this is big. You're preparing for next year, okay? The legacy of this year is going to show up next year, okay? So as much as possible, think about that, okay? Take care of burying seed by cultivation, okay? We know, okay, uh, you can bring things down, you can bring them up, but if you're stuck, you're better off, you know, mold bore plowing them under. And maybe next year, not mold bore plow again, but do some shallow cultivation. So those guys stay, you know, a foot to a foot and a half deep, you're not bringing them back up, okay? So this is what I usually tell growers. If they have a really bad year, and a you know, part of a field is really badly contaminated, a lot of weed seeds have fallen on the ground, I tell them that usually if they should probably mold bore plow that section, okay? And then next year, if they, if they need to use it, if they don't, I tell them, you know, just, you know, uh, summer fallow, just cultivation every couple of weeks or, 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 you know, spray a herbicide as things come up and try to draw down the seed bank. If not, if a lot of them say, I can't afford to just have, leave that, you know, two acres or five acres or whatever uh, barren, what I tell them then is when you plant and when you cultivate, do some shallow spring cultivation or disc harrowing, i.e. keep those, those weed seeds that, you know, they're high numbers that you've plowed under, leave them there, and just whatever's on the surface may come up, but you're not going to get this whole big flush, okay? So that's, that's a strategy that, that at least can get you out of trouble that year. I mean, you're still going to have a number of them there, but, okay? Using clean seed, of course, okay? 
Contaminated seed is the most common method of introducing wheat seeds to a given area. Absolutely true. Absolutely. Do not, you know, if something says certified, you know, read the label, just like nutrition facts. You start reading the, you know, the, the small print, and you start reading, oh, uh, there may be 1% of, and they list the species, or of these broths. So that doesn't mean that, that it's clean. As much as they certified, it's got to be certified zero, you know, nothing in there. So um, just in case you're thinking that. Livestock, the folks that have livestock, okay, watch them. Watch their movement. They're going from a contaminated area where, you know, there's velvet leaf. They're eating. The seeds are going to, you know, come through. They're going to bring them elsewhere, okay? They, they, they are not killed. A lot of these wheat seeds are not killed by the animal, okay? Unless you've got sheep or goats, they do, or chickens, they do a good job, much better job. But, but cattle particularly do not do a good job for these hard-seeded seeds that have physical dormancy, very hard seed coat. I mean, some of them will be killed, but a lot of them go right through ruminants. If, if you get over 150 Fahrenheit and it's, it's long enough, absolutely. We've, we've done some testing for some organic growers that were concerned. They were, getting, um, they were getting, in fact, some compost and manure, different composts, and one of their concerns was pathogens that they were going to bring into their fields. And this is true for our conventional guys, too. I mean, pathogens and, and weed seeds. And we did, I had an undergraduate student do a project, and we looked at the ones that didn't get to the high temperature. We monitored temperatures and the whole thing. Absolutely, you know, you would get velvet leaf coming out. You get lamb squatters. The grasses usually are re easy to kill. They don't have the hard seed coat. But the field bindweed didn't get killed. But those that did a good job, you know, they, they, they you know, aerated, turned it over and got the really nice seed. Yeah, that, and, and the pathogens too were not, which is really, you know, so it tells you that, yeah, it's done properly. Absolutely. It's a great way to do it. Okay? And that's true too of vegetative structures. So rhizomes and so forth, because one of, the, one of the concerns, they had some Canada thistle creeping roots, and they were worried that, you know, we we're going to throw that in there too, as they, just where they had the, the compost pile, actually, there was Canada thistle, and we tested it, and nothing came out. They were dead at those high temperatures. Anything less than that, you're going to get some escapes, and that's a concern, okay? Particularly, you know... Right. Which now introduces this whole compost enterprise into the state, and if somebody's not doing it right, right. Oh yeah. Then we have problems. So are there are there steps being taken from a wheat control standpoint? Is that is that built in? That the was way that compost operations have to be done in a particular way for you to, to sell it. Right. Uh, the the last I had seen it, and this was through the Cornell Waste Management Institute. That's right over here in Rice Hall. Um, they were in the process of putting in that kind of the, the regulations. Then they had asked us for some of the data we had collected and their folks, because there's some uh, individual companies, specific companies that do the testing for pathogens, for wheat seeds. Whether now that, that let, you know, it's been uh, implemented, I am not sure. Does anybody know, just based on from their own experience of that? But that's something to look into, is, is not just from the organic perspective, but also from our conventional growers, the small you know, livestock folks, you know, I mean, you often see, you just take, you know, manure. If you just take manure and you pile it up, like, and just leave it at that. And first of all, you notice the weed, see, the weed plants that just, you know, lambs could pick, I mean, perfect, perfect breeding ground for, you know, weeds galore. And I used to put a tarp over the thing, you know, don't, because then they, you know, they knock those off, they take it and they, they pass it on. That is not going to cut it because all those wheat seeds from the previous year. I mean, it happened to us on our research farm, so I can speak from experience that that happens. But you know, to answer your question about whether you know it's it's legislated, I have to talk to uh, Gene Bonatal is the contact. If you want to know more, Gene Bonatal is really they over in Rice Hall. They have a great website. They do composting. There, some of you guys probably have seen it. You know. When deer and animals die, they actually even do like composting of, of dead animals and, and how to do it properly and so forth. They're, they're really good. I mean, they're right in with, with the growers. But they, she'd be, she'd be. And if I see her, I'll ask her actually, because that's a good question. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I saw, I got some compost this summer from uh, an organic farm, and it was loaded with buggers and just stuff that came up out of the. Oh, yeah. 
the last time I brought in some, um, you know, compost from, I mean, I saw plants in my little, vet, you know, 20 by 30 vegetable patch that I had never seen in my life. Here I wasn't practicing what I was saying. I'm like, what is this? I've never seen this. I've never seen this. And I mean, I tried to pull them out, but I, every so often, just two years ago, I still see some of the plants, you know, popping. I mean, it's small enough, I don't mind, but I could imagine. And again, I didn't do my homework as to where I was just wanted some organic matter, and I was like a pretty desperate, and I went to kind of one of the local guys and just, you know, said, oh, yeah, help yourself. So, so chickens do a much better job in terms of, you know, crushing those seeds and so forth, okay? So... This is, this is important, okay, the whole thing of moving livestock in and out of infested area, clean farm machinery. I can't say more about that, but that is such a difficult thing. It's like all of us, we all want to clean up our cars and our pickups and stuff, but how many times, unless you're type A personality, that you have to absolutely have a sparkling, that is not done. It's one thing that, you know, how many pickups do I see that have, you know, ragweed seeds and, and you know, and particularly tillage equipment. You know, cultivators with rhizomes of quad grass hanging. I've seen it so many, even in, in, in dry, the Dryden area, a couple of the growers, I stop and say, look at you got, you know, hanging. And the guy's looking at me, yeah, right. You know, look at the whole, the whole field. So, did you have a question? Oh, well, that's what we're talking about in part, is that, that it's being, it, in the past it wasn't. And people, you know, you had compost, you just, but more and more they're, they're, they're being regulated. The question is, uh, uh, and, and I was, I remember seeing the regulations they wanted. They're very specific. Yeah, you needed to do a certain, they needed to be tested by. And so is that just on a commercial scale? Or? That wasn't on commercial, but what I think, Bob, and what I've been hearing, that even kind of the small scale, uh, now, if you're going to, it's for, for somebody who's going to sell it. If you want to use it on your, your own property, that might be a different story. But even there, you know, there's concerns, if not done properly. You know, you're going to bring pathogens in, you know, it's, but I think certainly at the, you know, personal level, that's not, it's, but certainly anything you want to sell. And that's why the big guys were being regulated first. The question is, has that gone down to the, the small, you know, 50 head, 25 head, the little, you know, the small farmer? Yes. I know what is happening, though, like throughout New York State, a lot of composting centers are being funded or farmers are given the proper equipment because most of the time they just don't have the compost turner and that's, the area. Right. So I know that's happening, but I don't know. Yeah, and NYSERDA and a couple of other groups, Ag and Markets, does provide that. But that would be good for some of you interested in that. I mean, that's, you know, for the grower, I mean, the, the couple of the, you know, the, the dairy guys I was talking, I mean, that was really good for them. I mean, it was, it was bringing in some extra money that they wouldn't have had. It's moving some of the stuff off their farm. A lot of them, you know, they're, they, you know, trying to get, you know, meet CAFO, you know, requirements and, and just, you know, they probably have more phosphorus than they can they can handle. So that was not a bad thing. Most of them were really happy at this, and they wanted to do it right. I mean, none of them wanted to just, you know, say, oh, I'm just going to get rid of it. They really want because they want the customers back. They want people coming back and say, hey, I got, you know, Pythium, and I've got all the, you know, really some nasty pathogens and, and disease and, and, and so forth. So, but the question whether to regulate it, I'm not, not sure at this stage. Yes. Right. Exactly, right. That's a really important, and more and more of the, the folks that I'm talking to exactly are also looking at that. So, yeah, this is definitely something that I'm, you know, I'm very much interested in as well, and some of the related to weed seed dormancy and so forth. But again, this is something, you know, one needs to, to think about. And then, like I said, if you want to see that popular article on, on machinery, um, you'd, be, you'd be surprised. This is a, a point of contention. These two last points, keep irrigation ditches and drain it free of weeds. Okay, I, I can see this. Control new species appearing on fence rows. Okay, roads, that's true. What we're running into problems is this whole idea of trying to clean field edges. Because you notice field edges, they didn't get sprayed, if, especially if you're using herbicides. They tend to have, you know, velvet leaf that's this size because it's by itself growing and dumping seeds into your field. And so there's been this big debate, you know, the true hardened growers will say, I don't, it's going to be clean. I'm going to just, you know. And then you have those that are kind of looking at it from a more diversity perspective and natural enemies uh, and so forth that say maybe it's not good to just have this clear stuff there, that this isn't really the way you should, you should manage these areas, okay? That you should allow some, some plants there um, and have diversity because there may be some beneficial insects, natural enemies of pests, 
That, so you'll hear that, okay? And so some people talk about beetle banks. Have anybody, anybody here heard of beetle banks? Where they try to grow like orchard grass, these mounds on you know, field edges that allow, and this is mostly like a no-till type system or reduced till, where they leave the residue on the surface, allow the beetles to come in, grab, because they, they, they go after weed seeds, they go after uh, corn and crop pests, okay? And then they retreat back to these you know, if you're going to be spraying or doing, they, they, they have a refuge, a place to go. But you have to minimize the servings. You can't be going there cultivating all the time. So in, in the UK, this is big. This is big stuff now, looking at Europe particularly, uh, because they ban the use of so many, you know, pesticides and so forth, herbicides in particular, that this, is, this is, is a way. But here, the culture is still, we want that area clean. We don't want to see, and I understand why. I mean, I know why, Okay. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's, that's an issue right now. Um, the other point is, um, you know, that we're seeing, we're seeing, and this has to do with nothing but cultural control. <gasps> Thank you, Sue. You saved me. Uh, has to do with um, how many of you guys actually spray herbicides or, you know, glyphosate? I've actually done some spraying, okay? How many at the kind of the farm level with tractor booms and so forth? Okay, what happens... What, what we're seeing, and this relates to field edges, okay, and what's been happening in the Midwest is that when you go over with the boom, you're spraying, and you get to the field edge very often, very often, okay, you don't turn off the sprayer in time, okay, and you still get glyphosate going on on top of your, um, your field edges that might have grass. Often it's grass, might have some other weeds, but in, in the Midwest, some of the places, and what happens is that the glyphosate, okay, basically kills all of your field edge, okay, that would have had turf. And turf was good because it suppressed any other weeds coming up. And what we're seeing in the Midwest, and many growers, we just, and I'll get you an article. We just had an article uh, last three, four months ago in, uh, it wasn't, what's it called, Midwest Farmer, or one of the popular uh, Midwestern uh, farming journals on this issue. What happens is that we're finding out that Giant ragweed, okay, Ambrosia trifida, which is the main, the main ragweed problem in the Midwest, it's not common ragweed, it's the Ambrosia remissifolia, is that it's becoming, it's first taking over the area wherever the grass was killed, so it's, and then what happens is that, that it's not really controlled well with, by glyphosate, and then when the folks are com combining or just, they drag, okay, the ragweed seeds into the field. And um, there's a PhD student here at Cornell that's from the Midwest, and I was hoping if he comes back in time, he's, doing, he's harvesting his fields in, in Iowa, comes in time, some of you may know Clay Mitchell. I want him to talk to you a bit about that and show you. He's really on top of the game. And, and we've, we have some digital uh, satellite imagery that really shows the strips coming off of the, of the giant ragweed. And that is the number one problem right now in the Midwest, Indiana, Iowa, okay, Ohio, uh, and, and it's, again, this, the reason that I thought of that was this whole field edge issue, okay? In that case, we're wiping out a competitive cover because our spring is not just as, as we turn around and the nozzles. And so he's been working with John Deere and other um, custom applicators to, to do a much better job with the nozzles in terms of on, off. And, and I want him to show you a video of, that he, he took to the music of Chariots of Fire of this spray rig going over hitting right at the field edge, boom, turns off. Not a drop comes in, passes over, and it's all GPS, GIS driven. Okay, really he's, he's into the high tech stuff. So I'm, I'm hoping that he's gonna get back in November after his harvest, at least get him in for half an hour or something to talk to you, okay? But that, just to tell you how important, so you have folks that will argue that you need more diversity in field edges. You'll have others that say, no, we need to wipe them out. But the concern is that if you wipe it out and you don't have anything there, you're likely to get a major weed. And, and so now we're getting glyphosate tolerant, I don't know if it's a resistance issue yet, but tolerant rag, giant ragweed, which is a big problem. How many of you have seen this plant? You know, if you go, I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's serious, okay? So with that, I'm gonna end this part of prevention, okay? Again, it's, it's often not, talked about much, but it's, I think more and more we need to be thinking about it, okay? So what I'll do is, um, I was able to get these in time. Um, so this is managerial control. We're going to get into, okay, 
crop rotation, intercropping. Okay? So remember what we're doing here. We're building our management toolbox. Okay? That's the way I look at it. Okay? So the next step would be what can we do from a cultural control, managerial control perspective? Okay? So cultural control of weeds. And I've separated from this category mechanical weed control. I'm gonna, I want to have one or two lectures specifically on mechanical because from a weed management perspective, that is, that's big stuff. Okay, and we can talk a bit, and I want to show you a video at some point, a, a DVD of uh, some machinery uh, that's being used. But for the next class or two, I want to talk a bit about managerial control, also referred to as cultural control. The two terms are synonymous. So if you hear that, ecological management, okay? I want to talk about the basic principles Okay, crop competition, which is so important, and yet, you know, we got to work with our plant breeder friends, that this needs to be, you know, bred back into our species, and I'll show you an example. And then, um, certainly crop rotation, I mean, I think that's very much an important component, and then particularly intercropping, relay cropping, cover cropping. All these terms, I hope by the end of this lecture or the next lecture, you should all be familiar with this if you haven't picked that up, okay? There are a couple of neat books. They're not on reserve, okay? But just if you want to know more about ecological management, uh, Matt Libman, uh, who's at Iowa State, okay? If any of you are thinking of doing graduate work in sustainable ag and stuff, Matt's like one of the best folks you can, you can go to, okay? Uh, and so, uh, and there's a book that uh, Chuck Moller, who's in my group, was a co-author called Ecological Management of Agricultural Weeds, and I think I do have a copy of that on reserve, if any of you are interested in the non-chemical control, okay? So, what we're gonna talk about today is, gonna, is this part right here, okay? Next day or two, and then when we move to tillage and, and mechanical control here, and so I'm just trying to show you a schematic of where does this all fit in, and how does, do these, some of these factors influence Weed community, and remember, think about it as a community, not just an individual species. Oh, I'm trying to control velvet leaf and soya bean. Think beyond that, okay? And things that are going to be important in, in, in cropping practices that are under the cultural control category are things like the variety that you use. This is so important, particularly for, for vegetables. The variety. We have some varieties, tremendously competitive snap beans. We have others that are just terrible. Knowing that is, is, is important, but there's going to be trade-offs because you would say, well, why, don't you, why doesn't everybody plant a more competitive one? There's going to be some trade-offs, and that's, that's what we're trying to think about. The sequence, kind of rotation spacing. Spacing is extremely important, okay? So what do you guys think from a spacing, row spacing um, perspective? Do you think narrow rows or wider rows from a weed management perspective? Forget about the crop. From a weed management perspective, what do you think would be the more favorable or the one that would give you greater suppressiveness of, of weeds? Narrow. Narrow. Okay. We can't always do it because we, our equipment might be just fitted perfectly for a 30-inch spacing and sometimes we can't do that. But I'll talk a bit about that, how we can, we can do that. Seeding rate. Uh, we can talk about that, you know, and again, we remember the law of constant final yield. There's only so much you could, more you could be seeding and, and not get anything in return because the, the curve flattens out. But you could still do that. Okay, duration of cover, okay, cover crops and fertility. Okay, don't feed the weed, feed the crop is kind of the way I always think about it. Okay, and all of these factors are going to influence, influence on biological factors. They influence the competition and so forth. Okay, they, and, and the tillage practices tend to, tend to, not always just that, the physical factors of the soil. But then combined with herbicides, if this is a conventional system, okay, would lead to a new community, okay? If you're an organic grower, okay, basically this part disappears and you've got your community. And depending on the crop, everything shifts. That's why it's a community changes. You might have one or two dominant species in each of these communities, but they're, they're typically very varied, okay? This is long. You don't have to all jot it down. It's all in your notes here and there. I just put it together in one, okay, category. So don't freak on me here because I know this is, I mean, if you were doing a PowerPoint presentation, remember, you guys would get hammered on. They, the folks in the IPM that have to do the project, do not do this. Low C is going to just, too many, too much words, too many slides. And it is too much. I could have even broken them up. But I just, 
wanted to throw them so you get to see here. So here are some of the principles. Many of them, you guys are aware of them. I just want to make sure you have them. At least you. A vigorous, well-adapted, well-managed crop is the least likely to be impacted by weeds. Absolutely true. You got a wimpish, diseased, you know, plant that, that not, is not getting enough fertilizer or just is not, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Many common practices are performed principally for purposes other than weed control, okay? But they can have strong impacts on weed communities through, through time, okay? That hurts me as a weed scientist because I always think everybody here thinks and lives weeds, but you guys know better. This is, you get out of this class, you're running off to another class and you've got to think about other things. But when you do this for a living, you kind of think everybody sees this, you know. So can you give me a practice, okay, a common practice that's performed that we often see in ag, but it's not really from a weed management perspective that's important, but that would impact weeds in a significant way. Crop rotation. What, why, why is crop rotation? I thought crop rotation was to keep weeds off balance. More, that's the, when crop rotation came in, it was not to manage weeds. It's for fertility, soil fertility. We kind of hung on after say, and on top of that, it helps from a weeds perspective. So that's exactly one practice. So although now, you know, it's important we want to keep the weeds, but really in the early 40s when, when uh, well, for, when, since the, the time that, Basically, crop rotation has been in place. It's really from a fertility management, okay? So that's, that's very important. What other, okay? Like uh, planting corn with fertilizer when it doesn't really need it. Right. So fertilization. I mean, you're not fertilizing for the weeds perspective, but boy, what you do and your timing, and we saw that, remember? The timing, the type, the form that your nitrogen is, is applied has an impact on weeds. Timing okay, has an impact. You put it at the wrong time, it may leach out or it may go to the weeds. So you're not doing it for the weeds, but boy, that practice in trying to, you know, uh, feed your crop is going to have a very important impact. Hopefully not a negative impact on your, you know, negative, I should say, a negative impact on your weed community. Hopefully it's not going to stimulate them to grow even more, okay? So keep that in mind. Cultural control of weeds refers to the integration of farm management practice in such a way to deliver maximum I mean, yeah, we want to do that. That's if from a weed management perspective, integrated. You're thinking many different things here. This is important. Cultural control of weeds is not remedial. What does that mean? What does that mean? Cultural control of weeds is not remedial. It's not something you can do to fix the problem after it's already been. Exactly. You, this is not, you know, therapeutic. It's a prophylactic a proactive type strategy, just like we've been talking about in IPM, okay? You gotta think ahead of time and say, okay, I need to rotate crops. Let's say I've got a, you know, I've got a grass problem here. I need to move to a dicot crop or I need to move to this competitive crop or, and so forth. You don't see, oh, I've got a weed problem. Um, let me um, rotate crops. You're not gonna do it in that year. You better start thinking about longer term. So this is where you, longer term planning, sustainability, that's where we run into problems where, you know, we talk about this year we should be rotating into this crop, but because the economics do not put it at an advantage, the corn prices are low, say, in a given year, the grower is going to just leave soybean for five years straight, okay? So the economics are going to play a role, but that is important. Cultural control is, is really, you know, at the baseline. It's, it's how you plan. Prevention, so you notice I'm doing it in the order that I'd like you to be thinking about it at the farm. Prevention, okay? Now, okay, things are going to get in. What can I do long-term on a managerial cultural control without even resorting to herbicides yet and mechanical control to give me a better chance? These are putting obstacles against these weeds, okay? Cultural control is likely to be relatively ineffective in isolation, okay? But has considerable power to enhance the value of other crop, uh, value of other crop protection activity. What this is saying is uh, it would be really good if, Everybody in the region you're in, you could be doing it at, on one field, you could be rotating, but you're not doing anything else in other fields in your, in, on your farm or your neighboring farms. If they're, you know, they don't care what's going on and milkweed seeds are flying back and forth, you could do the best job on your area, but they, they have, they've had you know, corn monoculture for 20 years, that's not a good thing because you're going to have certain weeds that are going to be there and they're coming into your field. So you really need to get that kind of buy-in by other growers. And usually most growers do rotate, you know, in this area. That would be something that's usually done, okay? 
Cultural control has considerable value, you know, in long-term strategy for weed management, okay? So especially the sole sustainable use of resources and management, okay? But it's long-term. You're not going to get the, the, you know, the returns right away, and that's hard for people because they want to hear, you know, with a herbicide, you put it down, and some of them, like Paraquat, in two days, you see the weeds gone, and you'll see it in lab. In some other herbicides, within two weeks, it's gone. This is uh, years. If you plan it properly, you do the right, the right control. Not everybody has the time or has the focus to do that or, you know, the land area. But think of it as a long-term strategy, okay? So the way I kind of think about it in, in, in your, you know, your situations is hopefully a lot of you kind of have an idea of where you want to go in your, you know, career-wise, professionally. What, if I would tell you if the world is great, and that's what I tell my advisees, you know, if the if the world was perfect, like where would you be once you're out of Cornell? Where would you be? Would you be in grad school? Would you be working or leading a you know, company? Would you be a business related to farming? And so that's kind of to me, you know, what are the things you can put in place, like prevention, okay, to help you get to that longer term? If, if you come to me and you say, uh, my main concern right now is to get a, an A in my, the weeds course, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's short term. You're trying to make it, and you have to do it. Because you, but I'm going to be talking to you about, well, what about other courses? Are, have you taken these courses that could really help you reach it? Okay? That's not to say you don't, you know, the moment you have to live now. You've got the prelims. You've got the exams now. But you need this longer term. You can't just be doing, oh, I'm just trying to survive, which we do. Survive, you know, prelim here. I've got the prelim there. And, and then you step back and, you, oh, okay, I think this is going to lead me to this career. Okay? That's what this is. It really takes more longer term planning, you know, were you sitting back and saying, yeah, where am I going with this? Is this going to be helpful? Okay? And unfortunately, just like we do in our personal lives, in ag, it's the same thing. We're, we're concerned with this year. Now, I've got the weed in there. What do I do? Okay? And again, I'm not saying all growers do that. We have a whole bunch of really innovative type growers. Okay? Again, pretty busy slide, but it all has to do, the main point here, as you read through this, is that, Boy, if we could work with those plant breeders and get some crops in there that are competitive, we would be at, at so much better, in, in a so much better position. Now, I'll give you the example, and I think I might have told you. We had a perfect example where in the 19, there's this experiment that was done with corn, a corn hybrid from the 1950s or 1940s, okay, and a more recent hybrid, okay, very same line, but, you know, just more recent. And they grew this, the experiment that they did, this was an experiment in 2000. They grew in Nebraska somewhere. They grew the old hybrid with weeds and without weeds. Okay, with weeds in the area, so weedy, a weedy field, clean field. And they grew the new hybrid, okay, that was just put out, I don't know if it was a pioneer or who, where it came from, but, and they grew that with the new hybrid with, the, with weeds and without weeds. And guess what? To nobody's surprise, the old hybrid from the 1950s out-competed, or at least out-yielded, the new hybrid when weeds were present. I mean, the new hybrid just got hammered, okay? However, if you had a clean field, i.e., the new hybrid, in terms of its yield potential, just blasted the old hybrid, okay? So all of this new, these new hybrids coming in, they're not being, you know, and that's, it's changing, but they have not been bred for competitive ability. And so, of course, the growers say, yeah, we need to have a clean field because these guys just don't have it. They don't have the traits where they put out leaves or fast-growing, whereas the older varieties, they didn't have herbicides back then. They had cultivate, so they had to battle with the weed. So, of course, the growers just selected those species, those hybrids that were good at competing with the weeds. But then as soon as we got herbicides and clean fields, we forgot about them. They're gone. And now, what, so what happens now, you know, we're saying, hey, you need to breed that into, because competition is an important part and generally goes unnoticed. People do. I see more and more of our vegetable growers being very on top of the game when it comes to, you know, the kind of varieties they're going to pick, especially for our brassicas. Okay? Very important. I'll show you a, a, a graph or a figure that shows you this. Some crop cultivars are more competitive than others. Okay? And some of them are very site specific, but you know, when they tell you grow this hybrid or grow this cultivar for your region, they mean it. There's a reason why that is, or on these types of soils, because that's been tested and it's usually the, 
hopefully the more competitive. In the past, used to be the ones that used to yield the highest. Now, more and more, they're also saying, not only will it yield better, but it also is more competitive. That means you could cut costs on pests or herbicide management, you know, you know herbicide costs and so forth. Okay? Uh, use of very competitive crops in rotations as cover crops or smother crops can increase the ability of the cropping system to suppress weeds. What's a cover crop? How would you define a cover crop? down, usually when the crop is not being grown. Actually, the cash crops after harvest or in between harvest, if you're doing double cropping, there's a gap in the summertime, you put in, what are some good examples of cover crops here in New York State in general? Rye would be one, buckwheat, clover, vetch, okay? So you go further south, it's, you start getting, you know, some really neat clovers and a whole bunch of others, but that's, so how is it different from smother crops? What, what's a smother crop? Sounds like, to me, they're pretty well the same, are they not? What's smothering mean? It suppresses. So these are, are crops very often, are, are species, very often they're the same as cover crops. But the real focus here is to suppress the weeds. Sudan grass is a good example. Buckwheat, okay? They are very much, we use them to suppress weeds. And you saw, if you went, remember Freeville, there were some of that around. There were some people who were asking, what's this thing? They had put down some buckwheat, okay? And there, so the focus there, yeah, of course, they'll protect the soil as well. So you're getting both. But really, they're putting that because they don't want the weeds to come up. Whereas the cover crops, really, you know, if you, for example, you put in rye, you know, in the fall, you really, the main goal is not to suppress weeds, generally, because you'll get winter annuals coming. But it's really to protect that soil from being eroded. So the focus is the soil versus smother crops tends to be weed suppression. Okay? Again, you will get rye that can do both. I mean, I put, you know, I put a cover crop in my little garden for winter. I put rye, and I do it for two reasons. For, to cover the soil, protect the soil over the winter, okay? To get, to suppress the weeds and get some, some biomass and organic matter as I, you know, I green, I till it under, okay? But one thing I learned, I don't know, some of you guys might know this, I, I got laid into tilling this, this rye in my vegetable patch and, and, you know, I, wait, I didn't wait long enough. I go in and I plant my tomatoes or whatever it was. Man, they looked starved for nitrogen. Does anybody know what might have happened? I don't fertilize, you know, in organic. The nitrogen was being used by the decomposers of the... Yeah, I mean, that's common sense. But, man, you know, that's, that's where timing is everything. Like, I knew it. I was thinking, oh, man, this, these, these microbes are going to take all this nitrogen. You know, my pepper, they look, you know... Afterwards, a little, you know, they didn't die. They got back and they were able to pick it up. But I was, it really made me realize how important that is, that, that period. Uh, so basically, nitrogen was being taken up by the microbial organisms that were basically breaking down the, the rye. I had not allowed enough time for this to become. Uh, so uh, I think it was like a week. I mean, I could still see this. this I mean, I knew it was wrong, but I was running out of time. I was like, and, and I'm now, you know... It, I, 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 I mean, it's not big enough. I just chopped, before it's seeding, I just chopped it down, laid it, and then let it dry a bit, and then went under, which is not the best. I didn't have, yeah, yeah like a much. Was, I wasn't practicing what I should know best. But it made me realize that timing, you know, so when we blame a grower, well, you know, timing, well, geez, they've got, you know, 500 acres, or they've got, you know, 200 cattle. It's, all of you know when you've got 10,000 things going. So to me, that was a wake-up call. I said, geez, you know, I wish I could take a, you know, picture of that. Okay, uh, so agronomic practices that promote early development of the cover crop or crop over weeds, so tillage, seed bed preparation, anything that gives your crop a competitive advantage is going to be very, and something that closes up, okay, the canopy. Why do you want that canopy to close over the weeds? Yeah, physically stopping them. What's the other important part of that? Yeah. Well, you're going to say to kind of, Sunlight. Remember that whole red to far red ratio issue? That's why you want this. So we've been working with some uh, plant breeders up in Canada, one of their ag stations. They've come up with something called short statured leafy corn. Okay, I should have brought a picture of it. And what, they're, what it is, it's these, these corn hybrids. Okay, so this is your typical, okay, you know, standard corn hybrid. These guys, these plant breeders, what they've done is they have these hybrids. They're shorter, 
but they have all their leaves, okay, are very close to the, they come out real early, and they're really close, they close up real fast. And I have a picture showing the, the interrow. And you look down the interrow with these guys, you see absolutely nothing about, you know, three weeks after. You look at our standard guys, lights getting through, weed seeds are popping up, you know, weed, seed, weed germination, okay, weed seedlings. So, and yields are comparable. That's the nice thing. So more and more, and the corn's, you know, about this size, but it's not, a, it's suppressing the weeds both physically, but also from a light perspective. So they're putting into practice, this is the kind of things I'm, I'm talking about, that you don't have to necessarily compromise yield, okay? I don't know if they've released any, but they were working with, I think they were working with Pioneer on, on, on doing this. Um, so, and, and if I get a chance, I'll, I'll show you the picture. I mean, it speaks volumes, you know, you look down and you go, wow, yeah, this is what we should be thinking about. Okay, so uh, from a crop, okay, crop-based weed management, okay, crop competition is frequently the most effective and economical weed control practice available, yet its contribution usually goes unnoticed and is seldom considered when a weed control program is planned or developed. Ross and Lemby, authors of your book, okay, emeriti professors from Purdue, well-known you know, tremendous experience in, 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 in weed science, well respected, and they're absolutely bang on, okay? That's exactly the way, when I was going into grad school and, and I was, why are people thinking this? I mean, it seems it's obvious, and maybe it was my ecology, plant ecology background, that and, and then I realized, okay, there's some probably practical limitations, but then the more I realized, no, it's just, it's, it wasn't thought about. And so, what can we manipulate to improve the competitive ability of the crop? These are some things that can be done that you should be thinking about, okay? Yes, density could be. If, as long as you don't reach that flattening asymptote of the curve from a law of constant final yield, you can increase, you know, your density. And we do it for silage. We'll usually increase the number of, of uh, you know, plants per acre because you know, the competition is not going to go full tilt. You'll be harvesting before you get, you know, you're not looking at, at grain and so forth, okay? We talked about row spacing. Narrowed the row spacing usually, there are many studies have shown, and we'll see that it's, it's very effective in suppressing weeds, if you can. What's one trade-off from a pest management perspective? Yes, it's narrow rows. Let's say you go down to 20 or 15 inch rows. Yeah, that'll allow the weeds to grow. Uh, the, the weeds to be suppressed more, but what could be a trade-off or a disadvantage from a pest management perspective? Not necessarily weeds. Insects or pathogens. Ins pathogens. You know, the conditions are a lot more humid. They're, they're, they're just more favorable to pathogens. We like, as growers, when we talk about we want aeration, wind to be moving. It's one of the things that when I talk to some of the vegetable growers there, and I tell them, hey, can we move those, the spacing a little, a little more? They, that's, depending on what they're growing, tends to be a concern, particularly pathogens. So, uh, and I understand that. I mean, that's, that's, that's where you have to balance things out. Crop genotype, okay, related to how competitive is that, or, you know, and planting date, okay? How should you choose a planting date if you're thinking about competitiveness? Increasing the competitiveness of your crop, what are some of the things you would be thinking about? Let's say next, next spring now you're taking over the family farm or you're, you've just been hired to run a farm and you're thinking, man, okay, let me see what I remember from Tony or the weeds course. What, what should I be thinking about? Okay, so try to get something there. What could be some other strategies? So you probably want to plant out of sync with the winter annuals seeding time. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I mean, you're trying to, to, to do that. Uh, what else could you do? I mean, related. You could do it early. What could be another strategy? If you could delay your planting, if, you know, and again, in New York State, upstate here, we always take a chance because our window of opportunity is so narrow and it's usually, you guys know that, what is it, May, June, July are our wettest months in the Ithaca area. Wettest months. And that's when we need to get, particularly May and June, over three and a half inches, okay, on average. Uh, you don't get that in many other places. I mean, it's, so you know that, you, you know, in a given year, you may not make it. And so to tell a grower, delay two weeks, because not even, and if you remember one of the, the, the graphs that I had out of Iowa that said, hey, if you delay it, this is what happens. You get 90% of the velvet leaf that will have germinated, and then you could put your crop in. You know, wipe them out, then you could put your crop in. 
How, what, but that is a strategy. You need to, you know, to balance it, okay? Um, but I, I totally agree with what Joe says also, is that we have some growers, and I'm sure some of you guys know this, um, that I see, you know, getting the corn in so early, and I know why they're doing it. I know from a temperature perspective, it doesn't make sense. The, the corn is going to sit there, maybe rot, although it's got fungicide on it. They're doing it because they have so many other chores to do, and they have to get that in, okay? But uh, very often, the corn is not going to be at a competitive advantage, okay? And uh, if you would just plant it a week later where that soil is really warm, and I see this in vegetables a lot, and I see it on my own. I use my garden as a kind of a little microcosm. And years that I've delayed it as much as possible, again, I'm not in it for the business, so maybe I don't have that pressure, but I put in stuff that is really when it should be put in, like the eggplants and tomatoes. And I put stuff two weeks prior to that in, in other years. They just sat there because it was cool. But when you get the right temperature and it's warm enough, they just take off. The problem is that that's not the only thing some of these growers are doing. They, or they have so much to do that they have to start early. At some, they can't wait till the end. Okay? So planting date, definitely. Either do it early enough to get the crop at a competitive edge. If it can handle cool temperatures or wet conditions, which not too many can, okay? Or at least... Okay, be able to, to plant them later. If you could delay planting, that would be great. And then you could do a stale seed bed and some of these, these practices we talked about. Oh, sorry. Okay, here's the row spacing. I don't have to show you all the studies, but most studies do support the idea that narrow row spacing reduces weed biomass. There's no question. Absolutely no question. It's, it's you know, uh, intraspecific competition, intraspecific competition. That, that, that works. Um, basically, you get an interaction, inter-row, intra-row competition, okay? That's important, okay? So what are the factors that affect row spacing? How do you, what do you need to, relative height of the crop and the weed, okay? You don't want, uh, you know, the weed to be overtopping your crop. That's not going to help, okay? You want something that has the same, same growth pattern. You have to be careful about nutrients, okay? You could have narrow rows, but you, your fertilization is, is not accurate or not, you know, appropriate, you lose that advantage of the narrow rows. I have seen it. You go in at the wrong time or you've got pigweed and you're just dumping that nitrogen like there's no tomorrow or just the wrong, or, you know, or the crop doesn't need it and you're still putting it on, okay? So that's not only wasting money but also, you know, putting it at competitive. Relative emergence rates, you need to, you know, the narrow row is fine as long as you get the, your crop coming. If your weeds come up way before your crop, who cares about the narrow rows? They're going to be up. And your crop, then your crop is going to be actually at a total disadvantage because it's, there's going to be a lot of interspecific competition and limitations of equipment. A lot of folks would love to have narrow rows, but most of their equipment is, uh, you know, 30-inch spacing. And, they, you know, just in some cases, you could take it apart and it's too tedious. Most folks don't want to be able to do that. This is the last slide I will just show you. This is the kind of the take-home, Okay. This is to show you how important variety is. If you think, oh, no, they're all the, whether it's a bean, it's a bean, a crop. No, it's not. They're not all equal. Okay? And this is a study from a good friend of mine up in Maine, University of Maine, Orono, if some of you know. Okay? Eric Gallant. Okay? Weed ecologist friend. And uh, he had some data that was looking at, uh, this is, so the way you read this is, um, this is the biomass. Okay? The, here's the, there's a one, two, three, four, five bean variety, snap beans, okay? Uh, black turtle, yellow eye, and some of you might be familiar with these. And this is the um, bean seed, okay? And the bean grown, this is the yield, the biomass of the bean, grown wheat free So the white bars, okay, are the, the different varieties. So you notice that when the different varieties of bean are grown without weeds, you get a, you know, Pretty well equal yield, although this guy, Mar Merrimax, Marifax, is, is, is significantly higher than this soldier, okay? But what I'm getting at is uh, there's a, and when you grow them, okay, when you grow them with the mustards, mustard weeds, look what happens to the yield of your beans for the different varieties. This guy, not much of a change, not much of a change, boom. This soldier guy drops, significantly different, okay? Weed free. Weeds, look at that, A, B, if the letters are different, that, that's indicating from a stats perspective there's a significant difference between the yields, okay? Soldier and Merrimax, look at these guys. If you would have had no weeds in there, 
they would have had, you know, again, this guy probably had the, the highest, okay, yield. Man, you put, you have it growing. You've got this variety growing with weeds, in this case mustards, it gets wiped out. This is the biomass of the weed, the bottom graph. Look at that. Look at the amount. This Marifax is doing Zippo when it's in competition. If you've got a weedy field, I would not use this. Or if you want something competitive, what it's saying, look at this black turtle. Look at the low biomass of the weeds when you have this. So this is a very competitive variety, okay? And look at that. It's almost no difference whether you grow this thing and some of the other ones too. But let's say you're trying to get good yield and lowest biomass because usually low biomass means fewer seed, wheat seeds going in the seed bank. My choice, if I were to ask you this in prelim two, based on this, what would be your choice on your farm for bean variety and tell me why, you should be able to tell me, first of all, I would pick something like black turtle because it's in, when it's weed free, it, it does relatively well. I mean, it's pretty good. It's not the highest, but it's pretty good. And certainly when the weeds are present, it still gives me, actually it gives me a greater yield. And on top of that, very little biomass for the weed. So this, and then you would look at what the characteristics are of this plant. But hopefully, you know, quality wise, the, you would get, and I may, you know, you might throw some economics and say, maybe with this variety, you don't get as much you know, the quality isn't as good or whatever. Okay, yes, sir. Can you pick between black, turtle, yellow, eye, Davis, caterpillar, type of that guy statistically? They're all, uh, there's no significant difference between them? Oh, you're good in stats. She's absolutely right. They're all, if they have at least the same common letter, that means they're not significantly different. Okay, so, right, and the top. So you're right, you could have picked any of those. But, you know, if you really were looking at absolute value, I would have said, if you had said either, you would have been correct. Because statistically, even though this, looks like it's got lower biomass, there's, no, there's probably so much variability that there isn't a significant difference for those of you who are familiar with. So absolutely. But I would definitely not pick. If I w were to say, um, if everything was equal and you had uh, the choice to pick your, your variety, but uh, you know, we would do a great job of controlling weeds. We have really, you know, it's easy, we can do it. I would pick Merrimax, okay? Uh, I mean, it, depending on, uh, although it's, Wheat free, it is not significantly different, except for this, okay, from, from the other variety. So, okay, but you get the idea here is variety, okay. Don't assume that everything, ask to use the right hybrid, okay, growing degree day, the right, you know, variety for your region, and ask if, in terms of its competitiveness. The more growers ask chemical reps and, and some of these seed companies, the more they're going to realize, and, and we're getting more and more of our wheat science grad students going into working in kind of the seed industry, and they're bringing it up, which is nice. So I've got a couple of them in Pioneer and, and DeKalb and some of these other important seed companies. Okay? I'll let you guys go. Have a great break. We'll see you guys on.